All right, everybody, welcome back to the channel for another Grain of Glass video. Today, I'm going to be doing something that I've really been wanting to do for a long period of time, a very interesting beer style that I don't think gets very much love on the commercial side of things outside of Germany, and that is the Alt beer. So Alt is the German word for old, uh, so that means obviously that this translates to old beer. Well, that's actually in reference to the old style of German brewing, which is ale brew. So alt beer along with Kolsch are two German styles that are called hybrid beers. They're not quite ales and they're not quite lagers. So hybrid beers like this use a very specific kind of yeast that is technically an ale yeast, but it's fermented at a colder temperature than most ales, around 50 to 60 degrees. But that temperature is also too warm for most lager yeasts. Um, and at the same time, it's going to be given a long lagering phase where it's stored at cold temperatures uh, and then it drank later on. Uh, so you end up with a beer that has basically many of the very same characteristics of a lager, however it's been brewed with ale yeast. And I think that creates a very interesting flavor profile and that's also just a very interesting beer to make and has a lot of history. So if this is the old style of German brewing, that means that the beer that we're trying to replicate today is pretty much the same exact way beer was made in the in the German area um, for the last hundreds, if not thousands of years. So I found that to be a really interesting connection to history and beer making as it has evolved or not evolved over the ages. And um, I think it's gonna be a pretty fun experiment. Alt beer originated in Dusseldorf, Germany originally, and Kolsch comes from Cologne. Now, interestingly, Cologne is basically right across the river from Dusseldorf. So the two cities developed their own completely unique styles of beer um, that have perpetuated over the centuries using the exact same brewing techniques and probably the exact same yeast. So it's just another thing I found very interesting about this style. So German beers are typically decoction mashed, and that means that you start out at a, a low temperature, scoop out some of the mash itself, the wet grain, uh, put it into a separate vessel and boil that and that creates a bunch of caramelization and melanoidins and then you return that to the original mash tun and that boiling addition raises the temperature of the entire mash up to the next step. This is done a few more times throughout the mash uh, to raise the temperature up to the next step. What I'm going to be doing today instead of a decoction mash is a step mash which is essentially the exact same thing without taking out the mash and boiling it. So I'm going to be using the heating element uh, in my recirculating system here to heat up the wort as it's recirculated to the next step temperature, hold it there for a period of time, and then keep going up to the next step, and so on and so forth. And this is something I've been dying to experiment with because single infusion mashing on its own is absolutely fine. It's perfect for about 95% of the beers out there, this one included. Um, but it's not a very personal way to involve yourself in your brewing. You're just sitting there and letting the mash happen at one temperature and walking away from it, you know, for an hour or so, and you're coming back and then you have wort. In this style, it feels more like you're creating the wort to be exactly what you want it to be. With a single infusion mash, as I'm sure most of you know, if you're holding just one temperature and it happens to be on the high or the low end of the single infusion mashing temperature window, uh, you're going to end up with a beer that has either too much body and not enough fermentability or too much fermentability and not enough body. Uh, and you really that Goldilocks zone for the single infusion mash is about 152 degrees Fahrenheit. And in 95% of cases that is perfectly sufficient to make a great beer. However, in some cases you want a beer that has high fermentability but also a decent amount of dextrins in it for you know, a lot of mouthfeel. Or you want a beer that has um, an extremely high efficiency in extract yield. You know, things there uh, that you can't just necessarily get from a single temperature. So what the step mash does is allows us to independently manipulate those variables. So I'm gonna do a mash that has a protein rest that creates a lot of proteins that support the head retention, allow me to pour a strong head on the beer and let it stay there. Um, and then I'm going to be doing a rest in the beta sacrification range or the lower range of what we're used to for mash temperatures and that is going to extract sugars from the grain and create a fermentable wort 
and then I'm gonna raise the temperature up to an alpha saccharification rest temperature. And that's gonna denature the beta enzyme and allow the alpha enzyme to take over and create dextrins or unfermentable sugars that are gonna add uh, sweetness, but also body and mouthfeel to the beer. Unless we'll do a mash out, which is gonna denature all the enzymes, lock in whatever pre-boil gravity we have, and also make it much easier for the wort to drain out from the grain bed uh, so that we get a good amount of liquid out of it. Uh, so there are some trade-offs to using a more advanced mashing technique. Uh, unfortunately, this is going to require about twice as much time as I normally use for the mash. So each individual temperature rest is going to have somewhere between like 20 and 60 minutes that it sits at that temperature. And then you have to account for rise time or the time that it takes to go from one step to the next. So the whole mash could take around two hours. If we're decoction mashing, the mash could take up to like three hours. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think it's gonna produce a more interesting and enjoyable result. And, you know, the more work you put into a beer, and if it turns out great, the more you're gonna enjoy it. So I think that's what's gonna happen here. The other thing to think about with step mashing is that you're gonna get a higher extract yield, which means you're gonna take more sugar out of the uh, malt than you would if you were just doing a standard single infusion mash. So if you're gonna be switching from single infusion to step mashing or decoction mashing, keep in mind that your efficiency is going to go up. So anyway, it is a really interesting beer style and it is a really interesting mashing style. So I'm gonna be trying a bunch of different stuff today. It's gonna to be a lot of fun or really stressful or both. So we'll see what happens. Um, I hope it's gonna be more on the fun side, but this is our recipe. Uh, so we're using 10 pounds of German Pilsner malt, two pounds of Munich malt, a pound and a quarter of melanoidin malts, and that's going to basically create a bunch of melanoidins or deep caramel kind of flavors that would be created during a traditional decoction mash, but since I'm not doing that, I'm gonna sub for it with uh, a specialty malt that kind of mimics those flavors. Um, we're also using half a pound of Munich and a quarter pound of Carafa 2 for color. Um, for a hops, I'm going to be doing one ounce of Magnum at 60 minutes, and then at 15 minutes, we're going to do one ounce of Spalt. Uh, so that's going to give us a relatively bitter beer. This is in the Dusseldorf alt beer style. There's also another kind of alt beer called the Northern German alt beer, and that's actually different. It's a lot less hoppy and bitter and a little bit more sweet caramel. Uh, this is going to be more along the lines of um, a bitter brownish um, type of beer, but uh, again, remember with those lager-like characteristics that crisp this up. Um, so basically, brown ale meets Vienna lager meets Czech Pilsner. Um, for our water profile, we're going to be using uh, relatively hard water here. We're going to be doing 76 parts per million of calcium, 19 parts per million of magnesium, 65 parts per million of sodium, 200 parts per million of sulfate, 100 parts per million of chloride and 54 parts per million of carbonate and um, adding 8 grams of gypsum, 5 grams of epsom and 1 gram of chalk to my water uh, in order to get that profile. Um, we're going to mash this with the step mash. So it's going to have a protein rest at 133 degrees Fahrenheit for 20 minutes and then a beta sacrification rest at 143 degrees Fahrenheit for 60 minutes an alpha sac rest at 158 degrees Fahrenheit for about 45 minutes, and then I'm gonna mash out at 168 Fahrenheit for five minutes. Uh, so for yeast, I'm using Y-Yeast 1007 German Ale, and I've made a yeast starter for that, which has been going for about three days now. Uh, so I should have enough healthy yeast to properly uh, pitch into the beer. So I added a Camden tablet to the water to get rid of any chlorine, uh, taste and I added uh, all of my brewing salts earlier so the strike water should be up to temp now and I think we should be able to start our first mash step pretty soon. Okay so right now the strike water is actually at 133 degrees Fahrenheit which is that intended protein rest temperature. The goal of this is to have the mash lose a little bit of temperature when I put the grain in but then have it come back up because this is a recirculating system I'm not going to overshoot the mash temp by doing that. Uh, secondly, I have started with about nine gallons of water in here and uh, we're just going to see how that goes. I'm not sure how the volumes are going to interact with the step mash, but we'll see.
All right, so I dowed in, and uh, we're gonna come back up to our temperature of about 133 degrees. And um, I'm gonna let this sit here for about 20 minutes. And then we'll start our next mash step. Okay, so we've uh, completely finished our protein rest now at 133, so it's time to change the temperature and move up to the next step. So that is gonna be 143 degrees Fahrenheit for one hour. So it's gonna take a little bit of time to get up to that temperature, but once we get there, we'll start the one hour uh, for that beta sac rest. Well, uh, the initial step mash schedule that I put together um, doesn't quite work the way I thought it would. So I just took a gravity measurement from the, uh, the wort as it is right now, right after uh, finishing up the beta sac rest, which was you know 60 minutes at 143 degrees. Well, we're still very low of our pre-boil OG target, and most of the extract yield from uh, from the malt is going to happen during that beta sac rest. So I'm thinking I need to make an on-the-fly adjustment here and lengthen the amount of time for that to another 30 minutes or so. So we're just going to let that sit for an extra 30 minutes and see if that changes anything. Hopefully it does. Um, it is a very low temperature and sometimes the lower temperatures do require a lot of extra time uh, to actually bring out all of the extracts. So I think that's just going to be an on the fly thing. If you do intend on doing the exact same step mash schedule, I do highly recommend uh, extending the beta sac rest to um, a full 90 minutes. So it's time to move up to our next step, which was 158 degrees uh, Fahrenheit for about 45 minutes. So I'm gonna go ahead and set that now. So in my excitement to try the step mash for the first time, I actually completely forgot to check the pH when the thing started. So. Now I'm like halfway through the mash and uh, haven't checked the pH yet, so it's time to do that. So I use pH strips to uh, sort of approximate the uh, pH of the mash. Can't really afford a high-end pH meter right now, so that's why I'm using this. And, uh, well, it's not surprising, but it looks like my mash is actually a bit more acidic than I wanted it to be. Um, Looks like it's somewhere below five right now, uh, which is not good. So in order to uh, return the pH to a reasonable level, I'm gonna add some baking soda, just about a tablespoon or so. Okay, so we've completed our alpha sacrification rest and it is time to move on to the mash out, uh, which is gonna be raising everything up to about a hundred and sixty-eight degrees, so just a change of about 10 degrees. Uh, we're gonna hold it there for about five minutes and uh, that's gonna promote a less viscous wort so that we're able to drain a lot more liquid out from the mash and uh, halt any sort of enzymatic activity that's going on. Well, we've officially hit our mash out and uh, this step mash took way longer than I had ever anticipated it would take. Um, something like three hours. I am kind of upset about the amount of time that that took, but hopefully the final beer and the final result is uh, is good enough to warrant the amount of time investment that I put into the mash. <laughs> but uh, let's start the boil now, I guess. So uh, I'm gonna start collecting the wort and um, the way I did this last brew actually worked out pretty well, so I basically transferred the wort from the boil kettle to this vessel right here um, via pump. And uh, that seems to have worked out pretty well, and I got a decent amount of liquid out of the first and second running, so we're gonna try and do that right now as well. So um, yeah, let's get to it. The word is looking nice and amber right now. That bodes well for the uh, final beer, at least in terms of appearance. Uh, so right now I'm just transferring the first runnings over into the kettle and uh, hopefully get uh, a decent amount of liquid out of that. And uh, then we'll sparge 
and add our second run exit later. Okay, so we have about five and a half gallons of work from the first runnings. So I'm gonna go ahead and sparge with about two and a half gallons worth of very hot water. And uh, we'll let that sit for another couple minutes and then we'll get our second runnings out of that. Okay, well we've uh, got our pre-boil original gravity sample in and it's pretty hot still, it's about 140 degrees. However, it is reading about 1.032, which translates to about 1.048 uh, with uh, temperature correction. So we are three points higher than our intended original gravity. So uh, that's pretty good. Step mash didn't really yield any extra extract um, as opposed to the standard single infusion mash, but it's good to know I didn't screw anything up either. So typically with Pilsner malt, I'll do a 90 minute boil uh, just to reduce the DMS in the beer that the uh, malt is notorious for producing. However, I think I'm just gonna go with a 60 minute boil on this one just for the sake of time and um, also because there's a lot of sources out there that also say that you don't really need a 90 minute boil to get rid of DMS in the Pilsner malt. So we'll see what happens. Um, but anyway, we're gonna do a 60 minute boil and obviously the boil has started, so now it's time to add my 60 minute edition of Magnum. And uh, that's gonna be our bittering edition, and then we'll come back in about uh, 45 minutes and we'll add our 15 minute hop edition and some other stuff. Okay, so the uh, boil has been going for about 45 minutes now. So we're about 15 minutes from the end of it. So I'm gonna go ahead and add my 15 minute hop edition, which is the one ounce of Spalter. And I'm also going to add some world flock and some yeast nutrient. So now I'm going to go ahead and recirculate uh, boiling wort through the pump and the chiller in order to sanitize it in preparation for cooling down the wort later. So I've got about 10 minutes left, uh, which will be all the time that I need to uh, sanitize the inside of it. So we'll get that started now. Okay, well the uh, boil is over. We just finished it up right now, so I'm going to go ahead and shut off all the heat sources. And uh, now we're going to go ahead and start chilling. So that's going to mean uh, dialing in the actual chiller output. And uh, I'm going to start using that first hot runoff to uh, sanitize the fermenter bucket here. All right, so the word output temperature on the plate chiller is now down to about 50 degrees, which is basically our pitching temperature. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and start uh, transferring the wort over to the fermenter, and then we can go ahead and put that in the fermentation chamber. As usual, I'm gonna go ahead and aerate by uh, just splashing the wort around as it enters the fermenter and uh, that's going to give us enough oxygen to have a healthy fermentation. So here's my yeast starter. So I've got the uh, 1007 German Ale in there. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and pitch that now. I'm gonna pitch the entire starter and uh, try to keep the stir bar uh, behind inside of the flask.
I'm gonna get all the yeast in there. And there we are. Okay, so the original gravity sample is in and it's about 1062 and a beautiful copper color right now. So I am very excited for how this beer is gonna turn out. Uh, we got a great OG, we had a pretty interesting mash schedule and um, all things considered, the brew day went pretty well. So as far as fermentation goes, we're gonna go ahead and put this in the fermentation chamber, which is also my keyser, uh, which I'm gonna set to about 55 degrees. Uh, we're gonna let that sit at 55 degrees for about two weeks or so, however long it takes to hit a good final gravity on this beer. Um, and then at that point, depending on the level of diacetyl in the beer, I may or may not do a diacetyl rest. If you taste a buttery flavor in the beer after two weeks, then it might be worth doing a diacetyl rest. If not, then I'm gonna go ahead and start uh, moving into the keg and then we'll lager that in the keg for several weeks, you know, until it's basically crystal clear. Uh, and at that point, the beer will be ready to serve. So uh, all in all, this has been a really great brew day, a really fun time. And uh, I think I've got a pretty solid beer out of this. So hopefully this uh, turns out pretty well. And uh, I'll catch up with you guys after fermentation is done. Okay, so the uh, final gravity on the alt beer is, is ready. Uh, still a lot of yeast in solution because this yeast does not drop out. But it looks like it's about 10, 16. Uh, which is about what we expected for our final gravity. So went ahead and kegged it today and uh, It's gonna go lager in my kegerator for a uh, good three weeks or so to clean itself up All right, so now it is exactly three weeks to the day uh, Since I put this in the keg it has been continuously lagering uh, sitting at 32 degrees for those entire three weeks um, And just so you know beer doesn't freeze at 32 degrees it freezes slightly lower um, but this has resulted in a pretty awesome beer at this period of time. So I'm pretty excited to share it with you guys. Um, I did perform a short diacetyl rest on it, basically after it was finished with its primary fermentation, took it out of the 50 degree fermentation uh, and brought it up to room temperature. And then I let it sit there at room temperature for three or four days uh, and then I kicked it. Um, but at that point it had hit its final gravity and uh, the flavor was pretty promising. So I have been sampling it sort of gradually as it's been lagering, and I really do believe that right now, three weeks in, it is really hitting an awesome stride. It has some pretty amazing lager-like characteristics, but also some characteristics much like an ale that I really want to share with you. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pour. Okay, so it's called Alpenglow. Uh, it turned out to be about 6.1% ABV and uh, 44 IBUs, which is pretty high for a German style, uh, but more on that later. So if you're wondering about the selection of the name on the beer, um, one of my, as some of you know, one of the things I'm into just as much as beer is uh, hiking and mountain sports. Uh, so uh, Alpenglow is the term for the uh, rosy red color that gets projected onto uh, mountain peaks after the sun has set. So after the sun sets and sinks below the horizon, the sun's rays reflect off of the atmosphere and back onto mountain peaks to produce this awesome effect. And uh, here's a picture of when I actually experienced it for myself uh, during a recent hiking trip. So that inspired this beer. Okay, so I usually try to select the appropriate glassware for each uh, style of beer that I brew, you know, as best I can. Um, but the alt beer style shares a uh, type of glassware with a Kolsch style um, that is rather unique and it's called a Stange glass and I think I'm pronouncing that correctly maybe maybe not but basically what the gist of it is is a very small 200 milliliter glass that is uh, very cylindrical in shape very narrow um, and the closest thing I have to that is this highball glass um, but then it's definitely not the same size uh, but either way I figured I'd try my best uh, to replicate the proper style uh, so here's the beer a couple minutes after pouring. It's a rusty red kind of color, not quite the same color as the mountaintops that I just showed you, but uh, that's okay. It kind of still reminds me of it. Um, yeah, it's like a moderate red, uh, rather dark without light behind it, but definitely red, not brown, uh, but not as copper as it probably could be. Uh, but that's all right. I think I actually nailed the color for the style. The head on it poured pretty good. Uh, it was... Um, pretty thick and, uh, and pillowy for a while, 
And now it's a good five minutes or so after I poured it and it's got a pretty solid lacing sticking around on the surface. It's not going away. Um, and I think you'll continue to see that as I drink this beer over the course of talking about it, it will actually remain. And I credit that to the step mashing technique that I used. I think that that might have made enough of a difference uh, in the head, but possibly also contributions from the Carafa 2 and the caramel malts that I used help to uh, construct a, a better head uh, to stick around longer in the beer as well. But anyway, um, it's a pretty awesome looking beer. I'm actually pretty proud of it. The other thing I didn't quite mention, but hopefully is apparent to you, is that it's actually rather clear. It's not like classically bright right now. It's not crystal, crystal clear, but it's pretty clear. And um, it will only continue to get clear as it sits in the keg. But three weeks is a long time, I think, for me to wait before I review a beer for YouTube. So uh, this is going to be what it is. All right, so next is the mouthfeel and uh, the body of the beer. It's got a really um, interesting mouthfeel in a good way. It's, um, it's actually much, I wouldn't say thick. Um, it's kind of like a medium to a medium full body mouthfeel. Um, it has, however, that lager like crispness to it. So it's kind of got this weird middle ground where it's not so thick that you think you're drinking something heavy and you can't put them away very quickly, but it's it's got a coating effect um, on your tongue. You can, the, the flavor does stick around for a while um, after you take a sip. Um, I guess it has a decent amount of, uh, of unfermentable sugars that came out of that mash schedule. Um, and it did end up with a rather high final gravity, uh, but that's okay because that was actually called for in the style. Overall, what I'm getting at is I think the mouthfeel of this actually really works very well. It's a little bit stronger than your typical alt beer, uh, you know, at 6%-ish ABV. Typically, alt beers are like 4.5 to 5.5, um, but I think it actually works pretty well with it. So, on to flavor. It's got a, um, a really interesting flavor, and it's a... it's. One of those beers that uh, you can't quite say is hop forward, but you also can't quite say it's malt forward. Um, it has a surprising amount of bitterness, as you saw from the IBUs. I did use Magnum, it's a relatively high alpha hop, to bitter with, um, and that does come forward. Uh, but it's a firm, exceptionally clean bitterness uh, that works pretty well. Um, but it's definitely much, much more bitter uh, in terms of hops than pretty much every other European lager-like beer, and I'm not, this obviously isn't a lager, but um, it's a lot more bitter than pretty much every other European lager-like beer that I've brewed. Um, it's uh, definitely got more hops in it. <laughs> but I don't think that really takes away from the flavor because the second half of the flavor is malt dominated. It's very strong in caramel and melanoidins. Um, the melanoidin malt portion that I put in comes through beautifully and it has this almost Bach-like effect. Um, without remaining overly sweet or overly caramel heavy, it's uh, it's got a deep rich flavor uh, that I think came from that melanoidin malt addition and man was that a good move. Um, not quite molasses, but a little more like a toasted caramel, toasted toffee kind of uh, caramel type thing. But again, like I said, not too sweet. And that brings me back to uh, to the hops, and I'm saying that that bittering addition is not too much because of the amount of uh, caramel flavor that's in this that has to get balanced out. So this is, in effect, a very balanced beer. I think there might just be a smidgen of diacetyl in here, um, but that's, again, with German lager-like beers, is actually a characteristic of the style, and that might be actually what is responsible for the increased perception of mouthfeel that I'm getting with this, um, because diacetyl tends to coat the mouth a little bit and give a little bit more uh, thickness to the body, or slickness, I guess, but uh, it's not really noticeable unless you're really trying to go for it, but... Uh, Yeah, a little bit, just a little bit, but it works. Doesn't take away from it. Um, so yeah, pretty awesome beer so far. I've, I've uh, gotten good reception on this. I gave a growler away uh, at a party a little while ago and uh, people were all over it. 
Uh, this is definitely one that goes into the books as being a pretty great beer. Um, I don't know if the step mash is really responsible for all of the characteristics outside of possibly the head retention. I think the beer that came out of it is pretty much the same as if I had mashed at 151, 152 uh, and done a single infusion mash that way. It would have been the same thing. Um, but I think it gave me a little bit more process and a little bit more, I kind of enjoy a little bit more process sometimes, especially when it's these German styles that are, you know, historically brewed very specifically and, you know, are famed for being so, so good. I think that was a really nice little nod to uh, tradition and I certainly had a lot of fun doing it. Whether or not it benefits the beer in many ways, I don't really know. Um, but uh, the beer that came out of it was undeniably pretty awesome. So I'm gonna give this, oh, I'm gonna give it probably an eight out of 10. It is one of the best malty beers I've made in a while. Uh, and I'm saying malty because I just made a really good IPA. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's got, I think it, I think I could dial back the hops edition just a little bit up front. Maybe use something like Pearl instead of Magnum, something slightly less uh, strong in terms of the bittering. And I think I could probably do with a little less Carafa too to make the color just a smidgen lighter. Uh, I think I would have liked this to be more of a um, kind of a copper color instead of this uh, dark red. Um, but it's still a pretty nice beer to look at, so really not too bad. So I'll just give it those two points. Uh, but everything else is just really awesome, and I'm very, very happy with how it's turned out. This one's a little dangerous. Uh, it's very tasty, very drinkable. Um, that 6% ABV doesn't really show up uh, until later. <laughs> I will say one thing that's going to sound a little pretentious, um, but that is that this is probably, in terms of taste and mouthfeel, the most German authentic feeling beer, I think, that I've made in a very long time, possibly since the German Pilsner that I made. Um, but this is still, it still feels even more on target than the Pilsner did. So I think this is one that 100% I'm gonna brew again. Um, and so I'd make some slight tweaks in the recipe, I think, and I'd have pretty awesome beer here. So uh, once again, you don't need to step mash this to make it. Uh, if you wanna make it yourself, just go ahead and do a single infusion at 152 and you'll be fine. This is definitely one of those beers that is gonna age really well. It's just gonna keep on getting cleaner and crispier and uh, just purer tasting as it lagers. Uh, so it's just gonna continue to get better. Um, so it's definitely one that's worth having in a keg or uh, in bottles for a long period of time. Um, and it's also one that I think is actually quite approachable to a number of people. So it's not quite a hoppy beer, but it's got some. And it's not quite a super malty beer, so you can still give it to somebody that likes bitter beer. And it's also uh, not quite a light lager, but you can give it to somebody that would that likes the characteristics of a light tasting lager. And it's not quite a dark beer, but it has enough caramel and malt complexity to give to somebody that likes dark beers. I think it's really just that perfect center point um, in terms of beer styles. And that's one of the reasons why I really wanted to brew it is because I don't think, I think you'd have to look pretty hard to find somebody that wouldn't actually like this beer. And I think it's a really great approachable style and I think it's not too hard to brew if you've got the right temperature control on it. Um, but it's a higher fermenting temperature than typical lagers are, even though it's an ale yeast, so you could probably get away with 50 to 60 degrees. So if you've got a particularly cold spot in your house, I recommend fermenting it there. Or you could try the swamp cooler setup where you leave your carboy in a bucket of ice water and wrap a wet towel around it and then just change out that towel and the ice every couple days or a couple hours, however long it takes to melt. Um, and that's a pretty effective method of kind of do-it-yourself lagering as well. Um, but I am very fortunate to have a space in which I can control it precisely, and I think that has helped the quality of my lagers. I'm sorry if this is gonna be a bit of a longer video, but there were some extra steps that I took uh, to make some interesting adjustments to the beer just for this one, just for the sake of experimentation. So thank you for sticking around on that. Let me know your thoughts and step mashing down below uh, on alt beers and German lagers and German styles in general. What do you think I did right, did wrong? I'd be willing to talk with you about it all. Uh, I really like all the comments. If you want to brew this beer yourself, let me know. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. I will do my best to answer them or help you out or point you in the right direction. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. It really helps the uh, channel become a lot more relevant to YouTube. And uh, if you like watching me do these things on a regular basis, please subscribe. I will tend to post a video to YouTube every one to two weeks. Uh, however fast I can get beers and kegs 
But if you want more frequent updates on the order of every couple days, feel free to check out my Instagram down below. That's at the apartment brewer on Instagram and I'll typically post stuff there that you're going to see eventually come here to the YouTube channel once I've actually done all the editing and stuff. Last but certainly not least, the recipe is down in the description box below if you want to use that for yourself. And uh, also is a compiled list of all of my equipment and links to Amazon where you can purchase them for yourself if you want. Just be advised that if you do purchase something through one of those links down below, I do earn a very small commission, but it's at no additional cost to you. And it just goes right back into this channel. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and finish off the rest of this awesome beer. And um, I will catch you in the next one. So cheers and happy brewing.